Uh, the title of my speech is Recent Movement of Geothermal Development in Japan, but not only recent movement, I will explain some basic of the geothermal energy itself. Hello. So this is the contents of my speech. Uh, the, the first, I will talk about general knowledge of geothermal energy. So I will make a, a quick review. And then the main part of uh, these two sections. One is before the nuclear accident in 2011. Why there was no geothermal development before the accident? And the second part is renewed opportunities. So then I will, ask, uh, I will talk about the recent movement after the big earthquake and the nuclear accident. And if I have a time, I will talk about technical challenges. Okay, the first part is this general knowledge. And first part is characteristic of geothermal power generation. And world geothermal power production and geothermal power production system and cost competitiveness and risks. So geothermal energy can be said uh, safe, stable and reliable renewable energy. So talking about safe aspect, it is environment friendly. It's a very low CO2 emission. Looking at the life cycle CO2 emission, life cycle means uh, not only the time when they producing the electric power, but we are look, looking at the, the time when they make the solar panel or windmill or something. Uh, these factories make, make some CO2 emission. So considering all these life cycle CO2 emission, geothermal power is the lowest, lowest, just the same as small hydro. So geothermal and small hydro are the only two energies which, which CO2 emission is lower than nuclear. Mm -hmm. So even though solar and wind and everything all this renewable energy has lower CO2 emission than all these fossil fuels, still they have some CO2 emission. And only these geothermal and hydro are better than nuclear in terms of CO2 emission. And another safe aspect is that no hazards. Um, the Electric generation system of geothermal power plant is the same as nuclear power plant and thermal power plant, but there is no fuel needed, and even though it's using the same steam turbine, it's steam is coming from the natural resource. So it's a natural boiler, natural water circulation makes the steam. So it's no hazards compared to nuclear energy. And stable and reliable aspect is high capacity factor. So even though geothermal is one of the renewable energy, there's not depending on weather. So 24 hours a day, 365 days a year operational. So looking at this table, uh, it's an average in Japan. And the capacity factor of solar PV is only 12% and wind power is approximately 20%. But geothermal is 70% and now it's higher than 95, recent ones are higher than 90%. And I looked at some European averages and some countries like Spain, when they have all the sunshine, it, it is 20% or 30% and wind is Wind in Spain is maybe 30%, but in Japan, uh, it's not sunny every day, and wind is not so strong. So considering these situations, for Japan, solar and wind is not very smart way. And another thing is that, um, another aspect of stable and reliable is geothermal energy is domestic resource. Of course, all these renewable energies are domestic resource, but 
speaking about this capacity factor, geothermal energy has very, geothermal power plant has very high capacity factor, just as like nuclear power or so, thermal power. And these, for these power plants, nuclear and thermal, we have to import the resources. But in Japan, we already have it. So um, domestic resources had a very strong point as not depending on international policies. So uh, geothermal power plants have such strong points. And another thing is that all geothermal power plants are all geothermal power plants in Japan survive the earthquake. Uh, since most of the geothermal energy Natu as a natural resources, most of them are located in northern part of Japan and in Kyushu. So almost half of the geothermal power plants are located in northern part. And all these power plants are located in a place where uh, there are some effects of the earthquake on March 11th, in 2011. And something like in Hachijojima, maybe the effect, effect of earthquake is not so strong, but somewhere around here must have some strong shakes. So the power line stopped, but Josama power plant itself was still working during and right after the earthquake. So uh, even right after the earthquake, they are uh, sending electricity to these affected areas. And looking at the geothermal power plant in the world, uh, in year 2013, install capacity is 11.6 gigawatt in total. I cannot see it's a big number or not, but <laughs> many countries use geothermal power. And looking at recent uh, geothermal development trend, USA has the biggest capacity, and um, the first blue one is 1995, and there are some drop, but still it's increasing now. And Philippines the second, and so on. And Japan is now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eighth. But this year, Kenya is very aggressive recently, and Kenya is going to catch up and overcome Japan this year. <laughs> The, the increase is so large here. So Japan will be the ninth. For, well, even though we, ha we are uh, uh, world fifth in the year of 1995 and 2000, we used to be the fifth, but now it's going to ninth. So Japan is so weak now. And this is a world trend of the Josama capacity. And the first year is 1946. In Italy, it's very small, but then increasing. And the first one in Japan is somewhere 1966, maybe here. So anyway, as a world trend, it's increasing. Oh, and another trend is that in the first, um, first few, um, what can I say? In the earlier Josama power plant, people look at only the very big, large-scale Josama resources. So they built very big Josama power plants, like some uh, 10 megawatts or even 100 megawatts or something. But now they are developing some even smaller scale ones. So now these parts include a lot of small capacity units. And this is the system of the steam power generation, geothermal steam power generation. And we drill at least two wells. One is production well and another is injection well. And the geothermal fluid. Fluid means the mixture of steam and water. It is coming up and at the separator, the steam is going to the turbine and the water will be re-injected to the underground. So then this steam 
rotates the turbine and make electricity. And in this kind of steam power generation, we need at least 200 degrees C or higher geothermal fluid from the underground. And in case of binary system, um, if the temperature is not as high as 200, but around 150 or so, we can make heat exchange to the second, secondary fluid. And this secondary fluid has a lower uh, evaporation temperature, and that makes uh, turbine to rotate even with some lower temperature. So that is the system of the binary cycle. So even in this case, we need at least 150 or 120 degrees C. And now there is another thing, low temperature binary system, hot spring power generation. It is called onsen hatsuden in Japanese. And it's a kind of binary system, but the second fluid is a mixture of, of water and ammonia, which evaporation temperature is even lower. So even with very high, low temperature, like 100 degrees C, or even 85 degrees C, we can make some power generation. The efficiency is rather, rather low, but still, um, normally for bathing, the temperature is too high, and you, you are just wasting heat. But using this system, making some heat exchange here, you you will get some electricity. So even though efficiency is lower, still it's better than wasting the heat. So now I'm talking about the subsurface system of the geothermal, geothermal power plant. And I would say just to find out geothermal reservoir is very difficult to get steam and Hot water from geothermal reservoir is very difficult, technically, compared to the oil field or gas field. And this is a basic figure of the oil or gas reservoir. And it's a horizontal layer. So the oil and gas reservoir is in the sandstone. And sandstone is just like a, um, like a sand. And so there are many, a lot of sand grains. and around each grain there is a pore, pore space. So the fluid can flow in this pore space in any directions. So it's very simple. And also it's a horizontal layer. So once you drill a well and get some oil, you can drill similar wells and then you, almost for sure you will get some oil. And even though there is a fault and depth is different, but still the structure is almost the same. So once you find out there is such a um, sandstone layer, you can find this oil and gas. But geothermal reservoir is totally different. Of course, there are some geological layers in at the forest, uh, sedimentary rocks. But um, the rock itself is very hard. There is no pore space. And then there is some tectonic pressure and so on, the very hard rock was influenced by this stress and get some cracks and fractures. So these cracks and fracture network makes some space for the fluid to flow. So it's not uh, it's not homogeneous, it's not it's heterogeneous. So it's very difficult to find in which direction flow water can be flow or um, from the surface exploration, we can find out, okay, this, this area is a geothermal reservoir, but we cannot identify each crack or each fracture. So that is the difference, a difficult thing. And the shape is just like a cloud. We don't know what, um, in which direction this reservoir is. Um, extending. So we, we have to find, first we have to find out where is this kind of cloud-shaped reservoir. And then we have to find out each fractures to find fluid. 
By the way, cracks look like this. And in the cracks and fractures, some fluid flows and some chemical components deposit inside these structures and which makes these kind of things, mineral dikes. So, in this case, you drill a well, three wells, and, okay, this one is very successful. It hits the fracture, so you can get some fluid. And for this case, uh, you cannot get any fluid. And for this case, you can get fluid. But looking carefully, these fractures are connected only in these parts. So maybe this well is okay for one year or two years or maybe three years. But after that, no more fluid is coming in. So maybe the production rate of this well would decrease very rapidly. So that is the difficult part of geothermal development. And so recently we have some more artificial techniques and we use some injection, new injection well and you put some cold water to inject into here and then the hot rock shrinks and makes more fractures. So then this well is connected well connected to these other parts of the fractures and then you can continue some more fluid, pro fluid production for longer years. So now we use this kind of artificial techniques. Now I'm talking about the uh, cost competitiveness of the geothermal electricity and heat. So it is, uh, this is for electricity and biomass solar has um, higher cost US cents per kilowatt hour. And so hydro is low, very low, and geothermal is rather low. So biomass has very wide range. Sometimes biomass is as low as hydro, but sometimes it's very high cost. So anyway, geothermal has very cost competitiveness. And this range is uh, conventional electricity, such like uh, thermal electricity. So if you can find the cost in this range, it means it has a very strong cost competitiveness. And this is heat. And again, biomass solar is very expensive, but geothermal is, uh, it's miss. Uh, so it's thermal is this range and geothermal is here. So geothermal is still uh, cost competitive. And talking about the risk, I told you that geothermal, to find geothermal energy is very difficult. So it had technical risks at the first, first part of the exploration. But then you do proceed exploration development, the risk is going down very rapidly. But in the beginning of the project, project the risk is very high. And sometimes it's very difficult for individual companies to cover all these risks. And it shows, this figure shows the kind of risks, um, market risk and country risk and technical risk. So talking about uh, developed countries like Japan and Iceland, all these countries, we are only talking about, talking about technical risk. But if you develop geothermal energy in Africa or South America or somewhere, maybe these risks are also should be con considered. Now I'm going to talk about before the nuclear accident in 2011. Why there was no geothermal development in development in Japan. Uh, this table shows the, num show the number of volcano and geothermal potential. This is the resource potential. And this is the power generation in year 2010. And Japan has world third biggest geothermal resources. And this number is not very precise because it's very difficult to 
calculate the, geothermal resources because it's subsurface and there is no many uncertainties. So there are many discussions which is the world biggest. USA or Indonesia. Indonesian people say we are the number one. USA is the number one. So let's say okay, number one to US and Indonesia, and number three is Japan. Uh, because Philippines, Mexico, all the other countries have one scale smaller energy. And at least Japan has 20 megawatts, so maybe it's been quite sure Japan is number three. So we have such a lot of energy resources, but still our power production is eighth in this uh, in, in 2010, and this year we are going to ninth. So why Japan is so bad about new development? And this is the Josama power plants. And we are showing this figure for more than 10 years because there is no change after the year 2000. So we have 17 geothermal fields already developed and 19 units we have. And total capacity is 500. 10 megawatts. Um, so I was showing this video for so many years. And this is world trend, and Japan trend is like this. So there is no increase after year 1999. And this is the capacity, and this is the power generation. And this is decreasing because sometimes the companies cannot pay for drilling new wells. So the each well's production is decreasing. And if you drill new wells, maybe you can recover the whole production. But they cannot afford to spend more money for new drillings. So there, these, sometimes the production rate is decreasing, and the whole total production, production is decreasing in Japan. So the reasons why there was no new geothermal power plant in Japan, considering the strong points of geothermal power is like stable power and high capacity factor, and low CO2 emission, and high energy return. Uh, energy return means used energy times uh, generation power. And looking at all these three strong points, these are uh, common with nuclear power. Therefore, under the federal policy push, pushing nuclear power, uh, how can I? If, if you press the upper button, it should move ah. the slide forward. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to use this one. Okay, oh, sorry. Ah. <laughs> So there are some laws and regulations which is not very useful for geothermal development, but these laws and regulations are just left as like this. Because for the politicians and officers, nuclear energy, nuclear energy is most important, and they didn't take care of geothermal energy. So then the geothermal business in Japan is very expensive and low, uh, high risk and low return. That's why there is no um, geothermal development in Japan recent years. And the most of the uh, the major obstacle for geothermal development is national parks and hot springs and cost, cost and risk. 80% of geothermal energy in Japan exists inside national parks where no exploration has been allowed, no development of course. Um, even scientific survey has been limited. That is one big thing. Another thing is hot springs. In Japan, there are so many onsens, and these onsens are owned by individual hot spring owners. So some hot spring owners make strong campaign against geothermal development in afraid of degradation of the springs in terms of amount and quality. And third is cost. Thermal nuclear power have been considered more cost effective, so that geothermal power plant has not been attractive for electric power suppliers. So I will explain about how these things have been improved after the ac nuclear accident in 2011. So 
now this is about the new opportunities. The first one is national parks. The cabinet decided to mitigate with restrictions on geothermal and wind de development in national parks in 2010. It, it is before the nuclear accident. It's for uh, to mitigate CO2 emission. So then they changed some uh, rules. Uh, so before they changed the rule, uh, we can develop geothermal power plants only outside these national parks. So this is 20% of the whole geothermal energy. And natural, national parks can be divided in one, two, three, four, five, five different classes. First one is ordinary zones. So in the new rule, we can develop ordinary zones of national parks, but the resource is very limited. And there are um, special protection zones where there are many um, very special animals, birds, and plants, and so on. So it should be protected. And uh, class one, two, three is class one is very similar to special protection zones. And class two is not that much important. And cl class three is class two and three are sometimes owned by individual people who are owning some hotels or some rice fields or this kind of uh, industrial or agricultural activities are made in this class two and three. So in the new rules, they uh, so in the old rules we cannot develop these parts. But in the new rule, basically this is prohibited to develop, but small scale development De development may be allowed in this area. So then the amount of resources we can develop is largely increased after the new regulation. And ho for hot springs, it's very difficult to make agreements with the hot spring owners, but still the Ministry of Environment new made some new guidelines in making this kind of discussion with local people. So we don't know if it works well or not, but at least it's very important that Ministry of Environment make some guidelines that they are showing that they are uh, supporting geothermal development. But about the cost, there are some financial support made by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. So I don't speak about the details, but at least some financial support about drilling and public acceptance, and also uh, by the feed-in tariffs. Tariff, they will, the government buy the geothermal power in very high price, so that is a good thing. So then, private sector started moving. The, the Japan Geothermal Association was established in year 2012. And before that, there is no such association by the private sectors. Only some develop, developers, some uh, resource developed companies make a small society, but the such society is consists of only four companies. But now there are 49 companies, including banks and everything. And also for small scale power plant, some industry makers are started making small power, uh, small power generators. So this figure shows the ongoing geothermal project in Japan. Before the nuclear accident, there there were only two projects here and there, but now there are four. How many? There are so many. Maybe 40 or 50 projects now. Such a big different, a big change. And it shows the very recent move, recent change in the geothermal capacities. And geothermal development takes many years, like five, six, or even ten years. So it's very difficult to increase the geothermal capacity. 
but for the small, small geothermal units, it's much easier and you can install small, small units in short period. So then these small units, oh, the blue one shows very small units. So this one, this one, this one, and the blue one, Hagenoyu. These five, five units are installed last year and the year before. So in recent two years, we got five new small power plants. And also this year, there are some other projects. So maybe we will get two or three more this year. So summary of recent movement is renewable preference after the nuclear power plant accident pushed Japanese government to support geothermal development. Financial incentives for geothermal development, training support, and FIT system are given by many. And new RD and D has become supported, and uh, supported by many. And MOE, a Minister of Environment, released constraints for national parks, and they also made guideline on giving geothermal drilling permission to speed up process and also guideline for the problem with hot spring owners. So industry. Industries have moved forward to accelerate domestic geothermal development. And currently, 44 or more exploration and or development projects are running. So then, I will talk about te technical challenges. So I came from AIST and working for national Institute for Advanced Industrial Science and Technology. And our institute has a main campus in Tsukuba, Ibaraki. But AIST made a new Fukushima Renewable Energy Institute in 2014, last year. And Josama studies by AIST, which used to be done in Tsukuba, it's uh, not would be, uh, yeah, it's now conducted in Fukushima Renewable Energy Institute, Freya, in Koryama City. So this is the main building, and there are some uh, buildings for wind and energy network and wind and so on. And in this new institute of AIST, we have six research teams and one is geothermal energy team, and the other one is shallow geothermal hydrogeology team. And this one is studying on geothermal heat pump system, not for power generation. So for geothermal power generation, this geothermal energy team is working. And I'm now supervising these two teams. So talking about geothermal team, energy team, um, Technologies for effective and sustainable use of geothermal energy. We will achieve effective development and sustainable management of geothermal reservoirs in harmony with hot spring resources by using our advanced measurement and exploration technologies for geothermal resource develop de development. So I skip the details. Yeah. We are also making database. Including, uh, including deep geothermal reservoir and hot springs. And this is coming from today's flyer. Um, this is research and development for EGS. EGS is Enhanced Geothermal System or Engineered Geothermal System. Even in Japanese, we call EGS simply. And that is uh, technologies for capacity improvement of geothermal reservoirs and artificial geothermal reservoir development will be developed to expand the geothermal power generation capacity capability area in, in harmony with the environment both in Japan and abroad. So this figure shows that uh, geothermal reservoir is normally somewhere around here, but we will use even deeper part, hotter part, and 
put some cold water and cold cold water will be heated by the natural heat here and then we can recover some steam and water. So now I'm talking about some other general technical things on geothermal energy, not from our institute's research units. So drilling success rate is a big issue in geothermal business, especially in early stage of development. So as I told you before, to hit the fracture is very difficult. So the first few wells maybe uh, would be a failure. They cannot get any steam. And technology improvement is needed. And in this case, technology improvement is not drilling technology itself, but exploration technology to decide drilling, drilling target is the key. So, um, at first, we don't know where should be the target. We don't know where is the fracture. So, drilling problem is not the drilling technology itself, but exploration pro uh, technology is the key. For this case, the first, this is the number of the wells drilled, and this is the average drilling success rates. And the first well is failure, so success rate is zero. And the second well is successful, so then, among these two, two ones, one is successful, so the success rate is 50%, and third is failure, fourth is failure, sixth, fifth is failure, and sixth is successful. So in this kind of bouncing, uh, finally, this curve is going to some certain success rate. So for this field in Kamojan, in Indonesia, success rate is 70%. So in the operation phase, after many years, they can get successful wells by 70%, but for the exploration stage, it's very low. So it's, uh, it's very risky. So we want to make some improvement in exploration technology. And this is called um, magnetotelluric method. Um, it is showing the electric, electric conductivity, uh, no, electric resistivity of the underground. So uh, low electric conductivity, show, low electric resistivity, high, high conductivity shows um, the top part of the geothermal reservoir. So maybe this part is geothermal reservoir. But still, it looks like just like a cloud and we don't know where the fracture. But this is the most commonly used method in the world for geothermal exploration. And exploration from the wells, we use well logging. So we put some zonde and the zonde has many sensors and then they measure many physical properties along the world. So the data looks like this. And another thing is that even after development of geothermal power plants, there are um, problems with sustainable production. And one is scale problem. Mineral components dissolved in geothermal fluids deposited inside wells and pipelines when fluid temperature decreases. That is called scale. It looks like this, and it's very hard. And calcium scale may be solved by acid fluid, but there's no effective solution for silica scale. Silica is just like glass, and it's very hard to, to, to remove. So it reduce, reduces well productivity drastically. So if the well is deposited with this scale, you have to drill new wells. And another thing is reservoir management. To keep production rate, a proper reservoir management is needed. So geomet geometry of production zone, or production wells, or injection wells should be decided by the reservoir engineer. Sometimes if the Production wells and injection wells, it's so close, the 
injected fluid has lower temperature than the reservoir, so it makes cold water coming to the production well, and it makes some problem for the power generation. And in some cases, after many years of production, injection fluid is amount of injection is always smaller than production. So in many years, not gradually the reservoir pressure is going down, so which makes some problem with production. In that case, not only re-injecting the water, but sometimes they use river water or something to artificially inject to the reservoir. So this figure is coming from Italian case, and they uh, their steam production is increasing so drastically, so they decided to put some river water injection injection water. So then the re their steam production is recovering like this. And some other innovative power plant ideas. These two show the binary plant recovering heat from other subsurface resources. Other subsurface resources means this case is a binary geothermal plant recovering heat from corn produced oil field. So this case subsurface resource is oil. So if they are putting some heat to the binary plant by uh, burning some oil in this case. And this case is a binary plant that make that means they have uh, lower temperature cycle, but they also use some flash turbine. Uh, maybe they have some uh, another place and they have some steam also, so they combine this binary cycle and some steam and making some bigger production. And this one is geothermal and solar hybrids. So um, this case is geothermal and solar thermal hybrids. That means solar thermal energy is put into the geothermal fluid to make temperature higher. And this case is uh, geothermal power plant itself is the same, but they put some solar power. And in case of low temperature geothermal power plants, like the geothermal fluid, it's 100 degree or something. Um, the power generation rate is very influenced by the atmospheric temperature. If atmos atmospheric temperature is high as like 40 degree, the power production rate is much lower when the atmospheric temperature is 20 degree. So in the summer season, they need some extra power. So this one is very effective in this case. In this area, uh, they, are, they got more sunshine in the summer season. So the shortage shortage of electricity by geothermal power plant is covered by solar panels. And in the end of my presentation, I'd like to show how the real geothermal power plant looks like. And I showed you this figure before, and this is subsurface part plus some uh, separator and so on, and this is a power genera generator. And in case of Yanai Nishiyama power plant in Fukushima prefecture, this part, the surface part, is owned by uh, Tohoku Electric Power Company. So the building looks like this. And the steam production is made by Okuaizu Geothermal Company. So steam production facility including wells looks like this. The well is somewhere here, so the well is going down, so it is the top of the well. And there are several production wells, and all these steams and hot water is going to somewhere, to the power plant by the pipelines. And this is a three-dimensional model of the subsurface part. So assuming this is the ground surface and they do so many wells. Some of the wells are not vertical, but some directional drain to get some more fluid. And this is geological model. So this kind of works uh, done by Okuaizu Geothermal Company. 
And then the steam is provided to the Tohoku Electric Power Company. And the turbine looks like this. And generate generator turbine and generator is here. So turbine is here and generator is here. So uh, it's very noisy here. <laughs> and then uh, beside the Jiyosama fluids, for cooling, they need some other circulation of, of water. And cooling water would be heated by the Jiyosama fluid. So then the cooling water should be cooled again by this cooling tower. So when you, if you go to the Jiyosama power plants, the most outsta outstanding thing from, most visible thing from outside is cooling tower. But it's not power generation. It's nothing. And it's not the Jiyosama fluid. It's just a circulating cool, cold water. And this is a central control room. So it's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. So uh, there's time for questions. Everybody can ask. <laughs> <laughs> They have a lot of experience, but uh, Indonesian people just use some overseas New Zealand technologies mainly. Mm -hmm. New Zealand and maybe America is um, good. America is good. Italy is good. There are many advanced countries. Mm -hmm. But another thing is that there are other um, differences for each field. So America is a very general land mm -hmm. continent. And compared to Japan, American fields are simpler. So American technologies are okay for America. And sometimes it's okay for Japan, but sometimes maybe not okay for Japan, Japanese field. And Japanese field has some more similarity with Philippines and Indonesia. And I would say Japan is still very good at technology, especially for exploration. We have a lot of experience in Indonesia and also some Kenyan fields or some overseas field. So even though there is no domestic geothermal power plants for many years, we still keep our technologies and we are still uh, improving our technologies. And especially for finding some micro seismic events, uh, our institute has very strong, it used to be belonging to Tohoku University, but very um, nice researcher moved to our institute. And we have maybe world top technology to find out the micro earthquake occurring. I didn't explain about this micro earthquake, but it's too advanced and it's not very um, commonly used yet. But I say that to find out the reservoir area, it's like cloud, it's, not, it's, it's possible, but to find out each fracture is very difficult. And now we are trying to find out each fracture. And when a fluid flows along this fracture, they, they make very small micro earthquakes. Mm -hmm. And it's like a it's like a sound, small sound. Yes. And we catch this sound on the surface seismometer. And the mechanism is just the same as natural earthquakes. Mm -hmm. But it, we are looking at very small earthquakes. Yes. And to detect these things, sensors should be better. And another thing is that most of the sensors are put on the ground surface. And in this case, the re resolution of the, the depth is very low. In many cases, um, if you use just the same analysis system, analyze system as uh, natural earthquakes, the 
resolution only in the plan view is fine, but the depth is totally wrong or something. So we try to get higher resolution for the for the depth. So we new, introduce new idea that most of the small earthquakes are coming from the same identical fracture, similar identical fractures. So we assume there are similar dominant fractures and put all these uh, source of the sounds on, onto the same same planes. And this technique is very uh, successful. And <laughs> we hope that I can say we are most advanced in yes. Yes. <laughs> exploration technology. But it's just yeah. only one part. Yes. There are many other difficulties in exploration. But um, yeah, I can say we are one of the <laughs> most advanced yes. technology. Yeah. フロント電気、ま、あの、地熱で、キャップみたいにこう帽子みたいになるんですよ。日本語で防岸って言ってるんですけど、このぐらいはっきりはしないんですけど、えっと、人間が人工的に起こせる電磁波の信号っていうのは、せいぜい深さとしては500メートルとか1キロいかないぐらいなんですね。で、あの、何をやってるかというと、太陽から来る電磁波を信号として太陽から電磁あの磁波が
自転車がある四国とか、はい、中部地方とかいないのは、はいないですね、あのそれは資源がないんですねあ,あのどこの図がいいかなちょっとあの見にくいんですけど、はい、あの説明しなかったけどこの図でいうとこの色の濃いところあの赤っぽくなってるところが資源が多いとされてるところなんですねでちょっとこれもあ,のあんまり正確ではないと言われてるんですけどまああの大体温度がちょっとこの北海道多すぎるって話があるんですけど、まあ、この辺りにはたくさんあとここもちょっと多すぎるって言われてますこの辺りはあの火山地帯でそういうとこはあの地下の温度が高くて資源がたくさんあって九州もそうなんですけど四国やなんか温泉はたくさんあって40度50度ぐらいの温泉はたくさんあるんですけどもなかなかあの、えー、とその今100度ぐらいでも発電できるって言いましたけどこの辺は100度はやっぱり少ないんですね。あの別府あたりだと100度ぐらいたくさんあるので九州はきっともっとどんどん増えると思うんですけどあの、まあ、85度で発電するとなれば四国やこの辺もポツポツとはあると思うんですけどまだでも数が少ないのであの将来的に増えてもやっぱりこの辺はそんなに増えないだろうという気がします。Yes. Okay. えっと、地下にそんな温度の高い熱源があるとその地表の温度も多少そ,のそこの辺りは温度が少し上がるっていうことはないんですかありますありますあの多少高いあその確かに多少なんですけど高くて、うん、あのリモートセンシングあの衛星データでここは高いんじゃないかっていうこと、うん、あの漠然とこの辺りはっていうことはなんとなく分かるっていうことがありますあ,あとですねあの温度じゃないけどあのそういう地帯っていうのはあのその地下で熱いものが出て粘土の地層とかが地表にも出てることが結構多いのでそういうあの地表の地質を調べてまずあの温度そのものは分からない場合でも昔温度が高かったであろうそういう地層が地表に出てるようなところでまず調査を始めてであの最初はそういう地表の地質の調査あとあのケミカルあの地下学ってのジオケミカルの。あの流体を調べて温泉自体で温泉といってもいろんな化学成分があって地下にかあの温度が高いものがあるところだと特有の何かあの SO2 が多いとかそういう成分が多いものがあると地下の温度どのぐらいかっていうふうに推定できたりしますただ温度は推定できても今度は場所がわからないのでソフトさっき言った太陽電磁場のあれで構造を調べて最終的にここだろうっていうことを調べるようになってます広いところから調べてだんだん狭く絞っていくという。